I had a 15-year-old boy one day in the mall, I was witnessing, he said, Sir, I prayed that prayer 12 different times. Like it was magic prayer, and magic prayer was going to change his life. This has nothing to do with magic prayer. Can you find that prayer in the Bible, yes or no? Absolutely not. It's not in the scriptures. Careful. Okay, sometimes we have traditions in our churches that actually are not biblical. We need to go back to what the scriptures say to get our answers and do that. So we're going to talk about this evening, okay? So my son got saved last night. Matter of fact, she said, when he came home last night, all he wanted to do was talk about the things of the Lord. When he woke up and came to breakfast this morning, all he wanted to do was talk about the things of the Lord. My son got saved last night. And she said, matter of fact, sir, I have been praying for you every single day since my son was born. I'm like, what? She said, I have been praying every single day for the salvation of my son, but I have been praying every single day for the person who would lead my son to Jesus Christ. Sir, I have been praying for you every single day for the past 18 years. I said, well, ma'am, there's something you don't know. She said, what do I know? I said, ma'am, I only got saved 15 years ago. That means she was praying for me when I was what? I was a lost guy, that's exactly right. And I remember going to college on a basketball scholarship, and all of a sudden, Rob Smith from FCA walked into my life. He was telling me about Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, Bishop Reeves started telling me about Jesus Christ. And Kim Cardwell, the manager on the basketball team, started telling me about Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, John Gibbons walked into my life and gave me a Bible. I never owned a Bible before. I was a Catholic kid. I never owned a Bible. I started reading this book. I started studying this book. God began to draw through that. And all of a sudden, four years, five years after college, uh, this man became born again and saved, and now God's using me all over the place. All because a mama was praying over in California, and God began to use it to draw me in college with people walking into my life. If you believe in God, don't we serve a wonderful God? Just think about that whole story, how it all plays out, okay? And I want to be part of that story, so we got to know what we believe, okay, as we begin to walk out and share our faith, okay? Let's pray. Father, you're so good to us, kind of us, gracious. But Father, you are indescribable in many ways, but you are very describable. You've given us evidence in your scriptures, evidence of creation, that we can know exactly who is the creator of this universe. Because that's the big question right now. That's the big question. Are there many right answers? Is there one right answer? Is there no right answers? Father, we have to find out. But we need to find out now, as this world continues its tumbling towards an interesting conclusion as we read Revelation. But we want to be leaders, we want to be impact players, we want to be light amongst the darkness. Father, I just got back from Canada a couple of days ago, Vancouver. It was so dark in Canada. So dark how they just were just taken Jesus Christ out of everything. But Father, you know Canada is not that far ahead of where America is going. If we as believers don't start making a bold stand for Jesus Christ. So Father, I just thank you tonight for what you're going to do in people's lives. Now, nice and quiet. I just want you to pray for the person on your right, the person on your left. They don't even know who they are. I just want you to pray for them, whatever you feel led to do. But I want you to pray to make sure whatever they're supposed to get out of this evening, no possible way they can ever miss what's going to happen to them. Okay, so just take some time and pray for that person. Kansas, so they were looking for what? 
Yeah, they were looking for tomatoes going, what a pretty storm, this is beautiful. And uh, I, I felt like an idiot uh, as I was. But, uh, but they were looking for tomatoes and stuff. And I wonder, where did all this come from? How did we get here and stuff like that, okay? Can you uh, wake that young man up next to you right there, his head and his hand right there for me? Yep. Okay, take, take your head out of your hand for me. Put your hand down. Yep. Go ahead and take your chin off your hand for me. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, no, it's just, it's, it's a way young man can sleep. I don't miss it. Okay. Uh, and you see the beautiful mountains and the snow, so I just got back from Vancouver, and just the beautiful mountains with all the snow and everything, okay? But how did this come to be? How did we get here like this, all right? In the beautiful mountains of Kentucky, correct? And, uh, or, you know, this is, and, uh, but, but, but how did this happen? How did we get here, okay? And then you see the beautiful beaches of Kentucky, and I began to wonder, um, you know, I go to Florida and stuff, and I just, these beautiful, I love the beaches at night with the winds blowing in, and just, uh, where did this come from? I had to find this out. And uh, the Grand Canyon. How many people have ever physically been to the Grand Canyon? I've never been there, okay? Okay, now you people who have been there, do pictures do justice, yes or no? no? Pictures are a colossal joke, okay? If you ever get a chance before you die to go to the Grand Canyon, go. It is the most unbelievable thing when you see that canyon and all the colors on the inside is fast. And the first time I saw it, well, the only time I saw it, I was um, staying in Phoenix. Um, how many of you, if I mention the name Charles Barkley, how many people know who I'm talking about? Mention Charles Barkley. Okay. We're all just getting so old now, okay? Um, I played college basketball with Charles Barkley. I was staying at his house in Phoenix, Arizona, going to some playoff series and stuff uh, a few years back. And so in between, they just won the Western Conference Finals. So they're getting ready for the final series against the Bulls in Jordan. And so in between, they had a few days off. So I just start driving around uh, Arizona. I want to check it out. Well, I drive up to see the Grand King. And I was absolutely blown away by it. A couple days later, when I come back to Charles' house, uh, he wasn't there. So I left him a note on his counter. Um, I didn't write on his counter, he's a pretty big guy, so I left it on paper on his counter, and I wrote this note, and I said, Charles, if you could ever go look at the Grand Canyon and tell me there is not a God, you are more of a man than I ever want to be in this lifetime. I was absolutely blown away by this beauty and the fingerprints of God when I saw it, okay, and the sun sets, and I began to wonder, okay, did this happen by the hand of God, or did this happen by chance? There are no other options out there. When you go out witnessing and talk with people, there is no other options on the table. This either happened by the special hand creation of Almighty God, or this happened by luck and by chance over time. I just needed to figure out which one it was, and I've got my answers as I walk through this life, and then I know what's going to happen after I die. Real simple, right? So one of the things I began to look at, you see this creation, and this design, and this art, in this order, and I wondered if we could look at evidence to make our decision and not just have blind faith and do that, all right? So that's what I began to wonder about, could be creation, design, art, in order to do that. A couple of years ago, um, I was speaking in New Jersey, I was already a believer in God at this point, and they came to pick me up at the airport in this van, so as they picked me up, drive me to the house I'm staying at, um, there was one of these sunsets. You ever see one of those sunsets that change every few minutes, okay, it changes every couple minutes, okay? The colors begin to change, it moves. One of those just absolutely phenomenal sunsets, okay? And then what I did was, as we began to drive, I began to pray. I said, Father, please, let someone look up at that sky and know for a fact that you painted that on the sky, all right? So they drove me to the house, um, stayed there. The next day I was speaking at a Christian high school. When I spoke at the high school, we, we teach you how to share your faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to do the next couple of nights. And when we teach you to do that, we give you the assignment to go do, to, to go do that, right? Now, the day we gave the students the assignment to go do it, it was October 31st. Now, what day is that? That's Halloween. Halloween is the easiest day of the year to share your faith in Jesus Christ, all right? People knock on your door all night wanting to hear about Jesus Christ, okay? They knock on the door, hey, how you doing? Great, hey, how you doing? Can I ask you a question? They ask the question, start with this thing. Throw some candy at them, they leave, and all of a sudden, a couple minutes later, knock, knock, and all night long, you can talk to these people who come to your door, okay? The other 364, you've got to go to them, but that night, they just come to you all night long. Well, when I give the assignment to do that, I do it myself. Well, that night, I already go to some early that day, but at that night, no one was coming to this house. It sat way off the road. It's kind of mansion-esque. I hate when I have to stay in those places. And uh, so it was kind of, so we're off the road. Also, about 9.15 or so, the doorbell rings. And the woman of the house goes up the door, and she opens up the door, and there's two people there trick-or-treating about nothing. But I looked at these ladies, and they looked a little too old to be trick-or-treating, okay? So I decided to butt in, and I do that a lot. And uh, so I, I butted in, and uh, I said, hey, how y'all doing? Uh, they said, good. I said, uh, how old are you? And the girl said, 20? And their faces are painted like cats and stuff like that, okay? And I said, okay, how old are you? She said, 21. I said, 21. I said, okay. And I said, and you're trick-or-treating? 
They said, well, one is some candy. I said, okay. I said, why did you choose this house? I said, it's a beautiful house. We want to take a look at it. So I gave a tour of someone else's house, and uh, I brought it back to the front. <laughs> I actually did that, and uh, so I brought it back to the front. And uh, so I said, hey, let me ask you an interesting question. So I began to witness to him, all right? And we're going to teach you how to do that the next couple of nights. And as we did that, one of the girls said, oh, no, no, we're atheists. There is no God. I said, okay. I said, so as an atheist, what's the best piece of evidence you have found that proves to you there is what? No God. Great question to ask an atheist. If you take your notes of you are, write that down. What's the best piece of evidence you have found that proves to you there is no God? One of the things we're going to teach you is sharing your faith is not a presentation. Sharing your faith is a conversation. It's a back and forth. Sharing your faith isn't a presentation. Sharing your faith is a conversation. Jesus had a conversation with the woman at the well. Jesus had a conversation with the rich young woman. Paul had a conversation with King Agrippa. So as you do conversation, you ask questions, make them defend what they believe. So I just said, what's the best use of evidence you have found that proves there is no God? And they just stood there. So I asked the question a second time, and they just stood there. And they looked and said, I guess we don't have any. I said, I guess you don't have any. You'll be stunned at how many people you meet that believe in a position but have no God. Evidence to back it up. You'll be amazed how people say they're Christians, but have no love. Evidence to back it up. Just because your parents are Christians, does that make Christianity true? Young people, I have videotaped at home of three and four year old Palestinian kids, okay, with uh, fake suicide belts on, bandanas chanting death to Israel. Okay, so just because your parents teach you it's okay to walk across the border, all right? Kill some Jewish people. Kill yourself and that's going to please your God, okay? I get a funny feeling you're wrong, all right? But just because your parents teach you something doesn't mean it's true. You've got to go a little deeper than that to find that out, okay? Can you get that young lady to stop sleeping for me right there, okay? Yep, sit up for me. Put your head up for me. Okay, thank you, okay? And uh, folks, don't, don't push me on this, okay? I'm serious about this because I'm very, very serious about people's souls. Right? I don't play games with this. In Atlanta, Georgia, where I live at, uh, 24 teenagers were killed in four months. 24. All right, that's one. That's more than one a week, folks. If you had someone die at your high school, middle school, not your head for Okay. Yeah, look at that. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's going on, teens. Okay. Very, very serious about this. Okay. That you, uh, you know, what you believe, and you stand up for that. Okay. So I said, I told the, the two girls at the door. I said, okay, let me give you something to think about. Easy way to do it. Let me give you something to think. about. I said, okay. I said, every time you see a creation like a shirt. You know, there's a creator who made it. Every time you see design like a watch, you know, there's a what? Designer who made it. Every time you see artwork and use things around you, whenever you're witnessing like that or like that, you use, use uh, things around Every time you know there's artwork, you know, there's an artist who made it. Every time you see order, like 20 Coke cups in a row, you know, there's a what? Orderer who made it. When you look at the universe, what do you see? You see creation, you see design, you see art, you see order. If every other thing has a creator, a designer, an artist and order behind it, why would you not think there's a creator, a designer, an artist and order behind the universe? All of a sudden, one of the girls said, wait a minute. She said, yesterday I walked outside right about dusk. I looked up in the what? sky and I saw that beautiful what? The sun said, I wondered to myself, who painted that on the sky? The exact prayer we threw up 24 hours where God allowed us to meet at least one of the people he answered the prayer with. And folks, guess what? Both the young ladies were art students at a local art college. What's an artist? Now, when you see a beautiful painting, there has to be a what? Painter who made the painting. See, they began to answer their own questions. We witnessed there for 20, 25 minutes, gave them tracks. At the end, I said, hey, I really enjoyed this conversation. No, no, we enjoyed this conversation. They were looking for evidence. Okay, we must have it to back it up. I was downtown Atlanta, and I handed this guy a track. He said it was an atheist, so I handed him a track. He took the track, and he read the track. When he finished with the track, he took it, and he crumpled the track up, and he threw it on the ground. Now, I don't mind if you hand it back to me. That's not a problem. I, mean, I don't care if you throw it out. I'll pick it back up and reuse it. I don't care if you throw it in a trash can. I'll probably reach in, and reach in there and get it, as long as it doesn't have like nacho cheese on it or something. But don't crumple my track up, man. I didn't, I didn't like the attitude. So he threw it down. So he began to walk away. So I walked after him. And uh, now, I'm not going to do anything, all right? I'm going to try to see if I can get it into a conversation. Because a lot of people try that, but you can stop them and get into a conversation, not a presentation. So as he walks away from me downtown Atlanta, also he's trying to cross the street, but you've seen those little red man and white man things pop up where you can't cross the street. Also, a red man popped up. Okay, and he had to stop on the corner. All right, so I walked up to him. I said, sir, before you walk away from me again, okay, just give me a smart out, okay, maybe he smiles. 
I said, do me one thing before you walk away. He said, okay. I said, prove to me there's a builder's that building. I pointed at this huge 50-story skyscraper, kind of like a downtown Wilmore or wherever we're at. And uh, I mean, this gigantic skyscraper. I mean, it was this huge thing, 50 stories. I said, prove to me there's a builder of that building. He looked at me and said, that's easy. What's the proof there's a builder to that building? What's the proof? It's there, that's exactly right. Because you know you don't lay down brick and mortar and lights and wood and wire and glass and turn your back and there's a building. Building is proof of a builder. I said, sir, I said, the sun, the moon, the stars, the ocean, the sand. I said, sir, every single snowflake, individually different. I said, sir, you have three billion pieces to your DNA, yet different from mine. I said, sir, if there's a builder to that simple little building right there, I said, sir, there must be a builder in this universe we stand in right now. Have you ever talked with somebody, you ever seen the light bulb go off behind their eyes where it pops? You can literally see it pop behind his eyes. He answered his own question. He knew building, builder, creation, creator. He knew it, okay? But then the question is, who is that going to be? But it's a very easy, simple, logical argument on how to do it, okay? But it still leaves open something else. Did this happen by evolution, or did this happen by the hand of special creation? We still got another area got to dig with, okay? If, you get, if you're being taught evolution in your middle school, high school, college, not your headphone if you are, okay? Pretty much the standard anymore. The question is whether it's true or not, right? Well, I began to study this because I was a public school kid, and I always got taught this as a kid. So when I began to study this, some interesting things began to happen. When you study Charles Darwin, okay? Darwin is not the author of evolution. Evolution is a few thousand years old, okay? But he was kind of the biggest proponent of it that really got hit the big time. When you study Darwin, he says there's one way to prove evolution true, one very simple, easy way. When you look at the fossil record, you're going to find millions upon millions upon millions of what? No, not fossils. They'll be there. They're fossils. What kind of fossils? Intermediate fossils called transitional forms, because we will spend more time in between the final state than between the two. We'll find much more in the middle, okay? There's a book out there called What Darwin Didn't Know. And see, what Darwin didn't have back in the 1800s is he didn't have the fossil record. Guess what we have here? We have the fossil record. And do you know the only thing you do not find in the fossil record is what? Transitional forms. You don't find them. You find whole woolly mammoths, whole coelacanth fish, whole saber-toothed tigers, whole dinosaurs. You find nothing in the in-between. Matter of fact, in one of my books, I have a quote from a, uh, a museum a curator in uh, England. He has, it's either six or seven million fossils in his museum. And someone asked me, excuse me, I see all your 7 million fossils. How come you don't have any transitional forms of your fossils? And the museum curator said, if I would have one transitional form, you can be rest assured that I would put it in my museum. He said, I don't have one. It's a theory, a belief system that's based not upon what? Evidence to back it up. Facts to back it up. In your textbooks, how many people have seen your textbooks where you have eight, you have man, and in between you have Piltdown man, Nebraska man, Peking man, Lucy, all the missing links. Not your head if you have these new textbooks, okay? Do you understand, young people, that every single missing link has been disproven scientifically? 100% disproven scientifically, yet they still show up in your textbooks, okay? That's why they're called missing links, because they're what? They're still missing. Nebraska man, okay? Nebraska. They found a tooth. And out of one tooth, they created an entire man out of one tooth that had skin, that had hair. How much skin and hair do you find on two folks? Okay, not a real lot, okay? Not only did they create that, uh, not only did they create that, they created his whole family with instruments and tools from a tooth. Ready for this, young people? 40 years later, they found that it was a tooth from an extinct pig. <laughs> it had nothing at all to do with humankind, yet it still shows up in our textbooks today, folks. you got to be very, very, very careful of deception in the country. Days, all right? It's, it's here now, but it's going to turn up the heat. It's going to be amazing in a couple of days. I did a youth conference in Florida, 2000 teenagers. When I finished, this 14-year-old girl walked up to me, and she said, I believe in evolution my entire life until you made this one point. And this is what I said. I said, if you put a computer right there, if you put a robot right here, you put a 747 airplane right here, and you put a worm right there, you ask any scientist out of those four, which is the most intricately designed out of those four, which, will, which one will scientists always tell you? The worm, when you study how the eye system works, how the digestive system works, okay, it's so intricate and detailed. But we know for a fact the computer had a crater design. We know for a fact uh, the robot had a crater design. We know for a fact that the 747 had a crater design. But the worm happened by luck and by chance over time. 
Wait just a minute. If the computer had a crater design and the robot had a crater design, the 747 had a crater design, not only would the world have to have a crater design, it must be much more grander crater design it could ever make, these are the three. See, when you look at the evidence, it kept pointing to there must be a God who made this whole thing. But it leaves open one more question. Who is that God? Is it the God of the Bible that created but would get involved with his creation? Is it the God of Islam, Allah, who is a deistic God, who created the whole universe and just sits back and watches it? And it's below him to get involved with it. Well, no, wait a minute, no, because the God of the Bible got in the parting Red Seas, came to visit Jesus Christ. Is it the gods of Hinduism, 300 million different gods? How do you know which one of these is true? So all you have to do, young people and adults, is make sure all you have to do is study the religious texts for each of the religions, then you can find out which one of these is true. It's really simple to do, right? As I began to study this, there was one uh, book that kept rising to the top. And this book was the Holy Bible. There was something about this book that set itself apart from all the other literature I was reading as I was trying to find the right answer for eternity. First thing, it was the best-selling book in the history of the world. Now, because it's the best-selling book in the history of the world, does that mean it's true, yes or no? No, it doesn't mean it's true. But because it is the best-selling, we ought to take a look at this book, yes or no? Yes, okay. If we're going to spend our time in, in school reading Shakespeare, Thoreau, and Beowulf, do you still read Beowulf, yes or no? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry, sorry. And uh, I had to do it too. And, uh, but if we're going to spend our time reading that, why are we taking the best of them in the history of the world? Every single year, young people, the Bible sells 150 million copies every single year. Any book even close to that? Harry Potter? Is Harry close to it? Harry's not even close, okay? Since the Gutenberg Press, there have been 4 billion Bibles printed since the Gutenberg Press. And there was something about that book. After 9-11, Peter Jennings, before he died, went to a Barnes & Noble Borders in New York City about a month after 9-11. He went with his TV crew and interviewed the manager. He said, hey, what have you been selling since 9-11? He said, oh, come follow me. And they went to the spirituality of the New Age section. Have you seen those in your bookstores, okay? Great places to witness, okay? Great place. I had a shaman witch there one time. I had a great talk. And, uh, but but that, that used to be the Christianity section, if you're old enough to remember that, but it's completely changed. He said, we sell a bunch of Then he said, come here. There's a shelf that said Bibles are like three of them. Let me We've been selling a bunch of these things. See, there's something about that book when things begin to happen. That's not enough to prove the truth. The book claims to be written by who? Who? Okay, it claims to be written by God. Now, most people aren't going to tell you that. They think that it was claimed to be written by man, okay? Not, that's not true. It claims to be written by God. But just because God claims the authorship, does that mean it's true? Yes or no? No, not at all, okay? Because I could write you a letter, hey, God told me for you to give me all your money, love God, okay? It doesn't mean God wrote that, okay? You need a little bit more evidence than that to do that, all right? Over 2,000 times in that book, it says, thus saith the what? Lord. In no way, shape, or form does the book claim human authorship. And I was really blown away by this when I began to study this, okay? Other thing that got me historical evidence. They have not found one historical mistake anywhere in that book, not one. If a man wrote it, wouldn't you expect historical mistakes? Yes or no? Yes, you would, right? Um, scientific evidence. The book, people say the Bible is not a scientific book. The problem is it makes scientific claims. And if the book makes a scientific claim, you better get it right if you're saying you're God putting this together, okay? Uh, and watch this. Science back in the day used to teach you that the earth was what shape? Flat, okay? The Bible said the earth was a sphere, all right? What do you know to be true today? The earth is a sphere, just like the Bible said. Back in the day, they taught you there were 1,100 stars in the sky. You could count them if you had a real long evening. You could actually count them if you wanted to do it, okay? 1,100. The Bible says they're innumerable. Do not waste your time. What do you know to be true today? They're innumerable. Yet God says he has a name for every single one of those, all right? Um, back in the day, they used to teach you that the earth sat on the back of a large animal, okay? Uh, there's old text where you can see the earth sitting on the back of a huge frog, and the earth was sitting on the back of a frog because they couldn't figure out how the earth was held up in the sky. Well, the Bible said the earth is a free flow. It just floats through space, and God holds it up. What do you know to be true today? It flows just as God says it does. See, the evidence began to be overwhelming to do that. You ever heard of the vanilla ice before? Ice, ice, baby, okay? Um, I got a chance to witness it one time in an airport. We had a 30-minute talk with the topic of God in an airport one time. And he's all into science, okay? He's a Scientologist and stuff. And so we were talking about this, and he was very intrigued. And uh, I told him I had a book called The 101 Scientific Facts in the Bible. He said, I would like that. So he gave me his name and his address. I got to send it to him because he was intrigued because his evidence, he was looking for evidence to back up what he was going to believe or not do that, okay? Uh, archaeological evidence. They have now found, they have found 25,000 archaeological finds in the Middle East that there were people in the Bible.
Bible, people's names and places in the Bible. Everything they dig up has proven that book to be what? True. Jewish archaeologists are coming to believe in Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, because of archaeology. Because everything they dig up proves that book to be true. It's blowing them away, Old and New Testament. That's all good stuff, okay? But there still needs to be something else. Who knows? In, in some ways, they have that for me, Missile, okay? Who knows the one thing about that book? There is no possible way it could be from the hands of men. It, it must be only from the hands of God. Who knows what the one thing about that book is that completely sets it apart? Yes, sir? Okay, one thing. Okay, you got it right there. Okay, here. Yep. Okay, well, say it again. Okay, a little bit more than just prophecy. What's the other word I'm looking for here? Not just prophecy. Say it? Yes, sir? Okay, uh, some of the other books claim salvation. Yeah. Okay, Revelation. I'm talking, I still want prophecy. You got half the Let's see what that happens. Okay, it's actually something called fulfilled prophecy. Okay? Because prophecy, by definition, a lot, a, a lot of different people can be pro prophetic, even though most religious texts don't do that. But you have Gene Dix, you have these magazines when you check out the grocery store, they're all these prophetic statements, okay? But fulfilled prophecy is what you want to do when you're talking to somebody. And fulfilled prophecy is something, uh, well, let's just go prophecy first. Prophecy is something said in the past or today that predicts the future. Doesn't mean it comes true, but predicts the future. Fulfilled prophecy means it what? Came true. That's the difference. Okay, fulfilled prophecy means it came true, okay? Um, I was on a ski lift one time with an atheist from Scotland, and uh, I was doing a big youth event. We were in Winter Park, Colorado. So we just thought everyone had a witness. So we went witnessing every day at the ski slopes and on the ski lifts, okay? So we witness all the time. And so we went up the ski lifts. Great place to witness. Where are they going to jump? I mean, they're going to jump or what, okay? And we didn't have anyone jump for four days. And I was glad, but uh, no one jumped, okay? So we just began to talk with people and witness. I witness on airplane flights. Why? They give you a flotation device, not a parachute. No one's going anywhere, okay? They're going to go with you the whole flight, okay? So it's witness eight years from Scotland. And we were in this box. So I was talking about the Bible to them. I said, the Bible is, I said, do you know what prophecy is? Make sure you talk the same definition, something said today on the past that predicts the future. The Bible is the only book that literally, 25% of that book, okay, literally predicts the future to the minutest of detail. I said, sir, do you know every single one of those has literally come true to the minutest of detail of these prophecies? And I said, sir, I said, man can't know the future to 100% accurate. I said, only who can know the future to 100% accurate? What's the answer? God. What the English from Scott said, what was his answer? He said, God, that's exactly right. He knew God. Then he said, what are some of those prophecies? And I said, okay. I said, um, whoever this Messiah is, be born in what town? Bethlehem, it says in the Bible, okay, back in Micah. Be born in Bethlehem. Not Jerusalem, not Atlanta, not Wilmore, Kentucky. Bethlehem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So where this Messiah is? He sold for 30 pieces of silver out of the book of Zechariah. Okay, not 29, not 730. sold for exactly 30 pieces of silver. He says, whoever this Messiah is. We pierced in his hands and his feet, written in Psalm 22, 800 years for crucifixion. So every use of means of torture and punishment by the Romans. Yet, Jesus was pierced in his hands and his feet. Late night, one night in the bar section of Atlanta, I was at this point in the conversation. I was wondering, whoa, did it stop? Is it stop? Is it stop? So what he said, you know your stuff, man. I said, you know your stuff. Christians in the room, should we know our stuff? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Lost people, they have great questions. And there are great answers to back this up. We need to be able to tell these people these answers to do that. Now remember, I just got an email the other day from somebody. If I, if I use the Bible to argue fulfilled prophecy, it's, they call it circular reasoning. Now that's actually true if you use a book to prove itself as circular reasoning. But always remember this about the Bible. The Bible is 40 authors, 66 books written over 1,500 years. 40 authors, 66 books, over 1,500 years. So if I use a book a 1,000 years later to prove a prophecy true, is that a circular reason? Absolutely not. Okay, so remember, that's how you get around it. Um, a good place to witness in your life is go to religion buildings by your universities, okay? University of Georgia has a religion department, so I go hang out there and talk with people. Well, I met a girl one day. She told me her professor has been teaching her that every prophecy is written down after it occurred. If the prophecy is written down after it occurred, is that prophecy? No, it's called history. I was standing there, building my faith. I didn't know what to say. And also, God just gave me an answer. I said, excuse me. I said, would you agree with me that the New Testament was written after the Old Testament? Yeah, it's minimum, minimum 200 years difference, minimum. I said, what about all the prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ in the New Testament that were predicted way back in the Old Testament? And all of a sudden, you can see the young lady's light bulb go off. 
that she realized her professor had been doing what? Lying to her. She realized sitting on a bench inside that building, he had been lying to her, okay? Well, guess what? Now it's really easy. Once I know the book is true, it's real simple to figure out where I go, okay? There's a place called heaven you can go to if you want to. All right? A place to be with Almighty God. Revelations 4, thunder, lightning, rainbow, powerful Almighty God in the book of Revelations. Sing, holy, 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 worthy is the Lamb who was and is to come. Unbelievable singing to see what happens before the throne of God. One of my friends uh, flatlined and died on an operating table. They paddled him, and he came back five seconds later. He looked at his father and said, Dad, you would not believe what I just saw. Dad said, what you, what you just saw? What do you mean what you just saw? I said, Dad, when I flatlined, my spirit rose up, I could see the flatline. I took off on this journey. I said, Dad, all of a sudden, this white light, this beautiful light, this consuming presence of love came over me, Dad. He said, there were these flowers of vibrant, beautiful colors I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, he's been blind for 20 years. Seen nothing for 20 years. And he came back telling everybody what he had seen while he had flatlined, okay? Uh, five days later, what happened to him? Well, he died five days later. Okay? But everyone knew he had to have seen this because he hasn't seen nothing in 20 years. He's described all this that he saw, okay? But the Bible also lets you know there's a place called hell. A place, a lake of fire, where people are tormented forever and ever and ever. It says more than one place. Uh, book of Matthew 25 says, A place reserved for the devil and his angels. Where it's going to be at. Do not buy the lie when people try to tell you about a Christless eternity. There is no such thing as a Christless eternity. Okay? It actually talks about the revelations of the wrath of the Lamb of God that these people get. Satan is not punishing people in hell. He is being what? Punished in hell. Do not buy this Christless eternity. People just don't want to say the word hell in our culture, okay? Hell is real, folks. Okay, people really do go there. All right? Um, you know how, how people flatline, see white lights and tunnels? You heard that before as a story I told you. I have now met 16 or 17 people who flatline, okay, who got the hell experience and not the heaven experience. A friend of mine flatlined at the end of his, he saw trees on fire, ground smoldering on the trees, literally saw a lake of fire in front of him. Literally said he could feel the heat of that lake of fire it was so intense. I met more than one person who got the lake of fire experience. I've had nurses come in, patients scream, the fire, the fire, the fire. Flatline, take a last breath and die. January, I was doing a conference, and a nurse walked up to me. She said, Mark, I just had a patient uh, die. And she said, before this woman died, she, she was flatlining. And she let out this blood curdling scream. Says there's two demons in the corner coming to get me. Please don't let me die. Don't let me die. No, no, no. Grabbing at the bed. The nurse turned and looked. She didn't see anything. The woman had screamed so loud. In the next room was a preacher, another woman that came running in to see what the commotion was. Okay? They look in the corner. They also said they saw the same two demons. Three people said they physically saw it with their eyes. Kept grabbing at that bed. Please don't let me die. Don't let me die. No, no, no. Flatlines and dies. Nurse tells me she looks back at the bed where the woman is grabbing the sheets, literally cut through the sheets with her nails at whatever she saw. She did not want to go there. A couple of years ago, at a breakfast buffet at a hotel, I struck up a conversation with a woman. She said, I must tell you a story. She said, in 1990, my husband flatlined and died. It was in all the Cincinnati papers. She flatlined, they paddled, nothing worked, he died. They pulled the wires out of him, wheel him off in a gurney, leave him in the hallway because he's dead. Ready for this? 15 minutes later, he sits up on the gurney, 15 minutes later dead for 15 minutes and sits up. She told me she walked directly over to her husband, and the first thing she said was, honey, what did you see? She said it was written all over his countenance. It wasn't, honey, welcome back, hey, honey, good to see you. It was, honey, what did you see? He tells her he goes down a dark tunnel. All can hear is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Have you heard this term before, folks? It's in your New Testament more than once. He said it was a vapor of fog. He could see the people's faces screaming. He kept going down. He said, all of a sudden, two hands of light came in there and grabbed him. And told his wife later, he knew it was Jesus. He knew it was Jesus. I've met more than one person who said they know it's Jesus Christ. When the light of the world shows up, folks, you don't miss it. Folks, do you know it's Jesus Christ? You must know this. You've got to know this or you can't be sharing this with people. You've got to know what this answer is, folks. Grabs him and starts pulling him up. And when he hit the top of the tunnel is when he sat up on the gurney 15 minutes later. She told me, she asked her husband the question, honey, what was the worst part of that experience? And you think it's anything I just mentioned, not what the man said. The man said the worst part of the experience was ready for this. He couldn't bring anybody out of there with him. 
Oh my, my, what do you know from the story of rich man and Lazarus, Luke chapter 16, which judgment is set heaven or hell, young people and adults, you shall be there forever and ever and ever. But what's it say? There is no what crossing over from one side to the other. One, you got to know what you believe, young people. And two, who you bring it with you. So if you die and go to hell, I guarantee you're bringing people with you. That's how the game works, okay? But if you're going to heaven, it because of Jesus Christ, it's now your job to make sure you bring people with you as you go there. But once hell is real, I have a very simple question. What separates one or the other? That's all I had to find out, and I could know where I was going, okay? And it's as easy as all you have to do is look at the Ten Commandments, and you can look at the law of God to figure out if you can be good enough to go to heaven. All right? That's what the girl, kid, Chelsea, kept saying on the plane today about her good works that was going to get her into heaven. Well, let's see if that's a true statement, okay? First commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me, okay? Is God the first and foremost thing in your entire life? No other gods except the God of the Bible, first and foremost. Okay, ask yourself a question. Have you broken that commandment? Second commandment, thou shalt not make unto themselves any graven image. What's another word for graven image? Any what? Idols. You can have no idols before Almighty God. Whether it's an idol you create to bow down and worship before. I met a guy in a plane flight. <clears throat> he was in the Buddhist and he has all these statues around his house and he bows down and worships too. Can sports become an idol young people? Yes, be very, very careful. Okay, about your love for your sport, okay? And do that. Can a boyfriend or girlfriend become an idol? Yes or no? Be very careful. You have to have someone on your arm you're in trouble. You're in trouble in the days to come. Watch people who go out with somebody else and they break up and others they with someone else on their arm. See, you're trying to say something when you do that. Can money become an idol? Yes or no? One of my students, I taught all boys school, he goes to LSU. I moved to Atlanta. And when I moved to Atlanta, uh, Josh called me up and said, Mr. Kale, how are you doing? So we start talking. I said, what have you been doing? He said, I started my own lawn care company. I said, great, Josh, was wonderful. I said, Mr. Kale, my first year, I took my money. I was able to buy three brand new mowers with cash. I was able to buy a truck with cash. Mr. Kale, at the end of the year, I've got $20,000 in cash left at the end of the year. I said, Josh, that's fantastic. He said, no, Mr. Kale, it's not. I said, why, Josh? I said, Mr. Kale, all I want is more and more and more. I said, Josh, that's called greed. Okay, that's called greed. But all of a sudden, his money became his idol. He had to have this money for what he wanted to do. What's the TV show, American Life? I had all the attention goes to me, the winter. All right there is the winter. Okay, I got a chance to witness to Ruben Stutter one time in an airport. Okay, we walked up to him, got in a conversation. We struck and started talking. Okay, and began to chat. And why? I don't care if you win American Life. I could care less. Okay, I need to know if you're born again and say the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all that's going to matter, okay? So ask yourself a question. Have you broken the second commandment? Have there any idols before Almighty God? A third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord God in vain. If you have used the words JC or GD once in a blasphemous way or even a flippant way, you have blasphemed the name of God. When you read the Old Testament, what's the penalty for blaspheming the name of God? Death by what? Stoning. They do not play games because the name of God is God. It's who it is. All right? Just like you wouldn't let anyone in this room, okay, blaspheme or talk bad about your mother or anything like that. You wouldn't let anyone do it. We watch people do it all the time. How many times have we watched people say, use JC or GD as curse words? You ever read people's lips on TV and stuff like that? Why is it? Why isn't it? Oh, Muhammad. Why isn't that a curse word in our culture, okay? Siddhartha Buddha, okay? Why isn't that a curse word? Because there's something about that name. That's the name that you've got to find out if this is the name of the Son of the Holy Spirit. God. We've got to find this out if this is true. Then we can go from there and do the bash yourself a question. Have you broken the third of the commandments? Fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. I do not care how you define keeping the Sabbath. You've broken it. 100% assured you've broken it. An Orthodox Jew, I've been in the a couple of those lately in airports, in Orthodox Jews, you can't do any work on the Sabbath. So their Sabbath is Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. So if they wake up on sun, Saturday morning, they still have and flip on the light switch, that's called what? Work. So when they do it, oh, it's the Sabbath. Boom, they turn it off. What they just do? Worked twice, okay? By just turning the light. That's considered work for them, okay? No matter how you define keeping the Sabbath, you've broken it. Any of you older people remember when you couldn't even touch Sunday back in the day? Remember days you couldn't touch Sunday? Sunday you could touch all you want to now in our culture. Now in most of our soccer tournaments, swimming meets, it ends on Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon. So you can drive back your Sunday afternoon evening because we got to make sure our kids on Monday don't miss what? School. Because school has taken precedence over our God and our culture of America today. You couldn't even touch Sunday back in the day. Okay? Ask yourself a question. Have you ever broken the fifth, fourth commandment of the Sabbath day holy? 
fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. Now, we kind of struggled that back in Georgia. I'm sure it's not a problem here in Kentucky, correct? No problems here? Okay. Oh, problems here. Okay, oh, I didn't know that. And uh, now, we have problems with this. Why do we have problems with honoring our mom and our dad? Think about that for a second, okay? Now, don't answer this. I want you to think about it. When your parents ask you to take out the trash, what's your response? What's your response when they ask you to do that? Okay. When your parents tell you your curfew is 10 o'clock, what's your response? What do we do? We turn into sports agents, start negotiating with mom and dad. Oh, come on, mom and dad, John down the street gets 11, mom and dad, why can't I have 11? Instead of saying, oh, mom and dad, you two are the sweetest. Thank you so much for not making that nine. You two might be the best parents. In the come here, mom and dad, give me a hug. Kiss me real quick. Come here, kiss me. Okay? Why don't we do that? Because there's naturally a rebellious heart in a person. And the Bible says rebellion is the same as witchcraft. What is witchcraft? You're trying to impose your will on a situation. That's what witchcraft does. You impose your will on a situation. What's a rebellious kid do? You impose your will on the situation your parents have already decided. Think about that for a second. You ever dishonored your mom and dad? I was doing a, one of these events in Illinois, and an 18 year old senior came up to my uh, hotel room doing it at a conference setting. And uh, he came to my room, and he sat on my couch, and just began to weep, and just began to cry, just sitting there crying. Oh, he stopped crying, I said, What? He said, When you talked about the fifth commandment, I was sitting in the back, and all of a sudden God took me back to when I was a five year old boy. And he starts showing me all the things that I did as a young man to dishonor my mom and my dad. And it finally broke this kid. He finally knew how wicked his sin was against a holy, righteous God. In high school, I was playing in a basketball game against Columbia High School. The first time I played Columbia, we beat him 69 to 66. It was a really good game. And I had 36 points. I had over half our team's points. Is that a good game? Yes or no? Oh, you love those ones. And uh, the next time we were playing, we were at Columbia's gym, full house, 2,000 people. And uh, uh, we're playing for the sub-region title. We're nine and other eight and once we're going for the title. That night I had nine points. I was the worst player in the history of American basketball. It's horrible, okay? I scored nine points in the dream of a real game. And late in the game, my buddy threw the ball. I went to catch the basketball. I went to dunk the basketball. As I went to catch the basketball, uh, the guy from Columbia went by to try to tip the basketball. And he missed it. But as he missed it, he clipped my foot. And when he clipped my foot, my two feet clipped together. And your two feet clipped together in a full gallop. What happens? Yeah, you fall flat. So I flopped over the lane. The ball was out of bounds. The referee blows his whistle and gives it to the other team. Now, I'm just going to tell you what I did, okay? I do not try this at home, okay? And I, I sat up on the lane, and I slapped the floor. I said, get in the game, ref. And I was just a rebellious kid, lost kid, so remember this, okay? And he said, technical foul. I took my hands. I went like that. Uh, one of my fingers popped up, and I looked at him. I said, F you, you son, is what I said to the referee, okay? Now, he gave me a technical. I had a funny feeling I earned that one. And uh, as, as this was playing itself out, there were two people sitting up. It was just an absolute perfect view of their pride and joy. Okay? Uh, who were those two people? Yeah, mom and daddy Caleb. Uh, could they have been any prouder at this moment? I mean, they have been really, 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 could they have been prouder? Well, the, the, the game ended. When the game ended, I decided to go home. I lived there. And uh, so I go home. And in our, at, at our house, you don't walk through the front, but you walk through the garage. Your home goes to the garage. Big room back where everyone sits at, and there's a little cut through to the uh, to the bedrooms. And so I walked in the house. My parents looked at me. I looked at them. They kind of nodded. I kind of nodded. They didn't say a word, so I just hit the cut through and went up to the bedroom. And the thing is, you know what? My parents didn't have to say a word because not only did I step over the line of bad behavior, I did the Carl Lewis long jump over the line of bad behavior. My conscience knew how horrible the event that was. And when I put this talk together a few years ago. When I got to this fifth commandment, I actually got a piece of paper out and I started writing. And it wound up being a five-page letter I wrote. And who did I write that letter to? Yeah, my mom and dad. And I asked them for forgiveness for the things that I did as a young man. I was not a believer, but there was still no excuse for my misbehavior to my parents as my authority structure. Well, as a kid, I wrote this five-page letter and I gave it to my mom and dad. My parents will tell you to this day, that's the best letter they've ever gotten in their life. Okay, because it was an honest, heartfelt letter of just what this young man had done wrong. Maybe some of you need to put pen to paper and write a letter before this uh, whole thing is done this week and hand something to a mom and dad. But ask yourself a question, have you broken the fifth commandment, honor thy mom and thy father, okay? Uh, sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill them. Most of us probably should be okay in this room. Uh, but uh, Jesus said, I love you so much, I'll make it simple. Even if you've been angry without cause, it's the same as committing what? 
murder. He will check your insides as well as outsides. But if you've been angry without cause, say this committee, when I've been on death row before, I've met inmates on death row, I have met murderers, every single murderer I've ever met, angered first, shot and killed their wife over something, angered first, knifed a buddy over a dice, because it's always insides that do lead us to outsides. Ask yourself a question, have you broken the sixth commandment? Seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now most of us are probably okay with this one, but Jesus said, I would make a sentence for it. If you even look upon a woman or someone with what? Lust it is the same as committing adultery. Because as a holy God, I can check your insides as well as check your outsides. If you have looked upon anyone with lust, one single time you have broken this commandment. Young people, young men, if you have looked at pornography one single time in your life, you have lusted for someone that is not your spouse. Okay? One of the big tricks of the enemy to get your young people hooked on your pornography and to yank you as far away from true relationships as you possibly can. Okay? Back in the day when I was a kid, the problem was these magazines and stuff. Okay? The magazines are not the problem, it's the problem. It's that. it's that internet. The internet is killing people. Young people, if you have an issue with pornography, you need to talk with your father about it. And if you do not have a relationship with your father to talk about this, you need to talk to some male older than you, a youth pastor, an SCA guy, because you need to get this nipped in the bud now. If you do not, I will guarantee you troubled days ahead for you. I will guarantee you that. Okay? Satan's lying to you on who this person's going to be one day. Okay? It's a total, complete lie. Uh, young ladies, be careful. It's not just the young men anymore. Mom and dads, I can't tell you the number of young ladies I have met addicted to pornography. Okay? Careful. Okay? I knew one family, the kid, the teenage boy said, Mom and Dad, I need the computer out of my bedroom. They took the computer and put it in the big family room. So the only time anyone was on the computer was in the family room. So everyone could watch what anyone was watching right there. Good idea. Okay? Be very careful with your cell phones. I know a young boy in Nevada struggling with pornography on his cell phone because he could get, get, get the internet. On his cell phone. Careful, careful, careful. I just saw a study. Ready for this? 25% of all pastors use pornography once a week. Pastors. Another study I saw said 40% of pastors. Okay? I don't use the study because I, I can't, I just don't want to believe this. But the problem back in the day, us men back there, we get our Bibles and books out and do our sermons. Well, we, guess what? We don't do that anymore. We get our sermons off the weapon. The internet, with a computer, in our offices, and next thing you know, boom, we can go somewhere we don't need to go. Careful in this age of deception. But ask yourself a question. question. Have you broken the seventh commandment? Thou shalt not commit adultery by spirit. Eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. If you've stolen one thing from anybody, you're officially a thief before the eyes of Almighty God. Stole one thing. You've taken one thing from a buddy, you're a thief. If you cheated on a test in school, you stole an answer off someone else's test. You're a thief. I asked my mom in high school one time, Mom, can I have 10 bucks to go out with my buddies uh, tonight, Friday night? Mom said, sure. So I went down to her purse and I took out a buck. I took a 20 out. Okay? A couple months ago, I told my mom what I did all those years ago. Mama never knew it. Guess who did know it? God and me. I had a conscience. When I keep mentioning these commandments and you stop paying attention and you start thinking about the exact time you did this, that's your conscience trying to tell you you've broken the commands of the Holy God. So I was to a young man in the mall one day. I said, hey man, you ever steal something? He said, yeah. I said, what did you do? He said, uh, he said, I was in the mall one day. My sister worked at Spencer's. Do you have Spencer's at your mall? Stuff like that, okay. Worked at Spencer's. He said, when I came in, the mall again was closing. I saw the security guard at the end. I walked down and he said, I knew Spencer's didn't have cameras. Now, that may have changed, but he said at the time they didn't have cameras. I walked in and um, there was a keychain back again. There was a Camaro keychain. And my mama's got a Camaro. I wanted to get my mama that Camaro keychain. What's it like, a buck 99 or something like that? So what'd you do? He said, I walked over there, picked up the keychain, took it, slid in my pocket, began to walk away. I said, what happened? So all of a sudden, my heart began to race, beads of sweat came up my floor, began to roll down the side of my head. Okay? Did you have to tell that young man that was wrong? Did you have to tell him? No, his whole system said it was wrong. Everything in his body said, what you did is not right. Okay? I said, what'd you do? He said, I turned back around, what a great word picture, walked back over, reached in my pocket, Put the keychain back up, walked away. I said, what happened? All of a sudden, my heart began to slow down, and my beads of sweat began to stop, just like that. See, his whole system said stealing was wrong. If you've stolen one thing in your entire life, you're a thief before a holy God. Ninth commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not lie. If you've lied to a parent, a friend, a teacher, to a huddle leader, one single time, you've broken this commandment. 
Okay? Think about that. Tenth command, thou shalt not covet. Coveting opens up all the doors for all the other sins. You covet someone's wife before you commit adultery. You covet someone's aunt on a test before you steal it. Okay? You covet, uh, coveting opens up all these doors, okay? And she begin to walk down this road, okay? And so it opens up the doors. Now watch this, we're going to get ready to close for it, okay? Your attention's been great, too. And uh, watch what it says in James 2. For whoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. If you break one of the Ten Commandments, you're like, you broke what? All of them. Here's the difference. Make sure you get this, okay? The difference is when you talk about a holy God, a holy God, one sin to a holy God is as bad as killing six million Jewish people. There is no difference to a holy God. Because when you talk about purity, impurity is wrong to him. And it doesn't matter how much. I was trying to explain to the, 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 the uh, Mormon girl next to my plane flight. So I took my pen out. I said, I said, I said if your shirt was perfect white, and I tapped your shirt with 30 times with this pen, I said, is it a perfect white shirt? And she said, no. I said, if I tap you once with this pen, is it still a perfect white shirt? She said, no. I said, no. And your good work, she can tell that all they can do is cover up the sin, and they can't what? Cleanse you and get rid of the sin. Okay, now watch. What I'm going to do is I'm going to throw some pictures up here. And I'll throw the person's picture, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you who it is, you're going to recognize who it is. And I'm going to ask you the question, by breaking one of the Ten Commandments, would this person be guilty or not guilty of judgment day? Then you just verbally shout out, guilty or not guilty. Okay, got me? Yes or no? Okay, all right. Uh, I, you know, by, by the standard of... Okay, and that means you don't have me because you didn't understand what I just said. Okay, I'm going to put the person's picture up there. I'm going to ask you, by the person breaking one of the Ten Commandments, would he be guilty or not guilty? And then at that point, you do what? You respond, okay? Adolf Hill, uh, by the standard breaking one of the Ten Commandments, uh, would he be guilty or not guilty of judgment day? Which one? Okay, uh, Timothy McVeigh, um, by the brand standard breaking one of the ten commandments, would he be guilty or not guilty on judgment day? Which one? <laughs> guilty, okay. Uh, Osama bin Laden, okay. Um, Osama, by the standard breaking one of the ten would he be guilty or not guilty on judgment day? Which one? <laughs> guilty, okay. Uh, Mother Teresa, by the standard breaking one of the ten would she be guilty or not guilty on judgment day? Which one? <laughs> okay, which one? Almost every single time I put this picture up in the talks, only a couple times, I end up getting both answers. Okay? One time I was doing a basketball banquet and there were second graders to 18 year olds, okay? I have no clue what you do with the second grader, okay? So the, the second graders wanted to come and lay on the, the steps to the stage in front of me. I said, fine, just be quiet. And so they just laid there all the time. Okay? When I did this part right here, it was a very mixed audience Muslims, atheists, Christians, a whole lot of them mixed, okay? Shouting out not guilty. People stood up and shouted out not guilty. Okay, as I put her up on the thing. Okay, all of a sudden, this little second grade boy jumps to his feet to the first uh, step of the stage, points his finger at me and says, Sir, I'm like, What? I'm doing a talk. What do you mean? He said, Sir, I'm like, What? He said, Don't you think she's lied at least once in her lifetime? Because second grade boys know second graders what? Lie. The Bible says, there is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Mother Teresa, guilty or not guilty, which one? Guilty. Billy Graham, guilty or not guilty, which one? Okay. Uh, me and you by that standard, guilty or not guilty, which one? Guilty. This was my problem. 6.5 billion people alive on planet Earth today, including you and me, are guilty by that standard. Every single person, literally, 100% Bible chapter 3 says, He that hath believed on the Son had everlasting life. He that does not believe on the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abide upon him. Folks, let me tell you something. I didn't want the wrath of my mom and dad. I didn't want the wrath of the coach. I definitely didn't want the wrath of God. How can I get that wrath of God off me? I had to find out. And here's what we began to happen. Okay, we're just about to close the book. 2 Corinthians 7, For godly sorrow, work of repentance to salvation, not to be repented, regretted of. But the sorrow of the world will work at that. If you get caught in something, you're mad, you get caught in something, that's not repentance. Okay? Repentance is when you realize you've offended God with your sin and you want to walk away from that sin, Psalm 51. It's a word we don't want to talk You need to talk about repentance. The word is all throughout the New Testament. Repent means a change of mind. It leads to a change of action. It means to turn and walk away from 
those things that have got you, okay? But still, that doesn't get rid of your past sin. I had to find out what it was. And all of a sudden, as I kept studying, it began to make sense. I studied the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you took a lamb, you put the lamb on the altar, and by faith, you put your hands on the lamb, by faith, your sin would transfer onto the altar, but to the lamb. And when they cut the throat, the shedding of the blood, your sin was remissed and gone. I was talking to a Jewish scholar teacher. I said, okay. I said, how often do you have to do this? You come back every year. I said, do you still do that? He said, no. I said, no. I said, what do you mean, no? He said, the temple's not up in Jerusalem. I said, excuse me, sir. If the God of the universe is a blood sacrifice for your sin, it means a blood sacrifice for your sin. It doesn't mean you can do 10 essay questions to be right with God, be a good person. If he says blood sacrifice, what is the answer then, sir? I kept reading on it in the New Testament. There's a guy named Jesus Christ. They called the perfect sacrifice one for all sin. They called him the lamb that take away the sins of the world. And all of a sudden I realized that what God was doing, he was pointing forward to the day his son was going to die in a place where we never needed animal sacrifice again. As I was talking to a Jewish scholar going up a ski lift, we got to the top, I explained all this to him, and as we tip our skis up so we don't clip, he looks and he says, I have never thought about the fact of a human sacrifice for sin before. But it's what it was pointed to the entire time. Which Jesus Christ, but he said, I'm not even going to leave you there. I'm going to tell you I'm going to conquer death. I'm going to tell you to get out of that grave. And if he gets out of the grave three days later, you can be rest assured you've got the right answer. And three days later, he rose from the dead. Over 500 different people saw him appear, I think it was 13 different places in the New Testament. He did not do this in hiding. He did it wide open public. Excuse me, aren't the guy, weren't you the one we saw two weeks ago on that cross? And for 40 days, he began to appear to people chosen. He, he just said, I conquer death, so will you. You're going to conquer it to heaven, young people. Or you're going to conquer it to hell. And last thing, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from how much sin? All sin. You have to have zero sin to get to heaven, young people. That's it. Zero sin to get to heaven. Because all of us have broken at least one of the Ten Commandments, we have a serious problem. A guy looked at me and said one time, he said, Mark, two ways to get to heaven. Either be 100% good or 100% forgiven. That's it, one or the other. Any of us passed the 100% good test? Nope. That means I need 100% forgiveness. Young people, you can search high and low, okay? The answer was 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ I had the answer for your sin problem. But the point now is you have to do something with that. One guy to me the other day said, hey, Jesus died on the cross for everybody's sins. I said, he died for the sins of the world. But it's not for you until you take it and apply it to your life and do that. Just because I was going to give you this laser pointer, it's still my laser pointer until you do what? Once you take it, it's not yours. Jesus Christ died for you, folks, but until you take it, and apply it, it's not yours. Young people, you can be rest assured when you die. Your parents won't be there. I won't be there. FCA won't be there. The youth passion won't be there. You and God alone. You have to decide what you do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And as I pray to close here, um, I want you to get out something. If you have something to write on, I want you to write one word down for me. Okay? If you don't, I just want you to remember one word in your head as I close it for you. Now, when I tell you it's time to write, I want you to write one word down. I'll tell you when to do that. And then I want you to cover up what you've got. Okay? You can close your notebook or you can fold a piece of paper put it in your pocket. But it's between you and the piece of paper. Young people, ask the paper quick to close for you. Alright? Remember this, alright? Do not look at the person next to you. It's none of your business what they write. Just you and a piece of paper you got. Understand what I'm doing? Not your Understand? Okay, let's pray. Father. Wow. Thank you for truth. Father, we can prove there's a God. We can prove the Bible true. We know from your scriptures and scriptures will open us to heaven or hell. But you're so gracious, Father God, not to leave us hoping we can go somewhere, as the girl told me today. I hope I get to heaven. I had a Muslim guy. I hope I go to paradise. Father, we don't need to hope about nothing here. You tell us how to get there. All we have to do is look at the Ten Commandments and know how we stand. It's a simple mirror. That can tell us how we look spiritually. So heads down for a second. I just want you to think when I ask these questions. If you stood in front of God today, not being moral, not being anything like that, but we're in Kentucky, one of the school shootings happened in Kentucky. 
We live around in Lexington. We had a plane crash here in Lexington recently. It can happen. It can happen to anybody. A week ago, a week and a half ago, I speak at a Christian camp like this. Next camp over, 18-year-old senior flips his Jeep. Senior's dead. The driver's dead. The other two boys in the hospital. Just, just like that, off to eternity. Okay? Not being more, but just reality. Ask yourself a question. If you stood in front of God today, just held up the Ten Commandments. Say, who told a lie before? <clears throat> Think about the time you told a lie. If you've ever told one lie, you're officially a liar before a holy God. Ask yourself a question. You're stolen without thinking of life. If you've stolen one thing at any point in your life, you're officially a thief before a holy God. Ask yourself a question. You've ever lusted in your heart. One single time for a righteous God and an adulterer. Ever take the Lord's name in vain? Use it flippantly in a joking way? You're a blasphemer for Almighty God. Ever dishonor your mom and dad? Break the fifth commandment? If you've dishonored your mom and dad one single time, you're rebellious. In rebellion to sin is witchcraft. You've broken the fifth commandment. Have you ever been angry with someone? Anger without cause before a holy God is the same as committing murder because everyone you're angry at is made in the image of God. It's no different than being angry with God himself. If today was judgment day, if you'd be a liar, a thief, blasphemer, adulterer, murder, dishonor, mom and dad, you broke one of those, you broke them all. If you stood in front of God today and you knew you'd be guilty by that standard, just be honest, raise your hand up and say, I think you'd be guilty by that standard. Okay? My hand's down. Now, if you know that means hell instead of heaven, when you die, be honest, raise your hand if it means hell instead of heaven. Okay? Hands down. Remember, if you're guilty of a court in Kentucky, you get the punishment. You're guilty before Almighty God, you get the punishment. Ask yourself a question. Do you want to repent of those sins? Christianity is not adding Jesus Christ to your life. You never add Jesus Christ to your life. If you witness to a Hindu, they will add Jesus Christ to the 300 million gods they already believe in. They just add to the collection. You don't add Jesus Christ to your life. He becomes your life. Do you want to repent of your sins? Turn a different life. And do you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ? A choice between you and the Holy Spirit if you feel he's drawing. That's a decision you have to make between you and God. Okay? Heads down for a second. Have you write one word on your, on your card, one word on your piece of paper? Don't forget till I tell you, right? I want you to write down one of two words. The first word to write down, if you decide to write this word down, is the word condemned. If you knew you would die today, if you know you would die today, and you'd be condemned because of your breaking God's law, I want you to be very, very honest between you and God on a piece of paper. And in a second, if you write, I want you to be honest and write the word condemned. If you know you'd be forgiven, because you know what you've done with Jesus Christ, if you know without a shadow of a doubt, no little inkling in your heart, there's nothing but forgiven there. I want you to be honest and write the word forgiven. So it's, it's going to be a choice you make. If you know you'd be condemned, be honest. You may have faked your parents out, faked your other leaders out, faked your youth pastor out, but you know the truth. Okay, so that's what we're trying to get to is truth. If you know you'd be condemned, I want you to write the word condemned. If you know you'd be forgiven, I want you to write the word forgiven. Okay, now, nice and quiet. No looking at the answer. I want you to quietly write an answer down. Okay? And put it on a piece of paper and stay quiet. Cover that up. Rip, rip it out of your book and put it in your pocket. I just want you to keep it to yourself and nobody else. Right? If someone does not have a pen, look down the next and see if someone doesn't have a pen, you can hand them a pen for that one. If you do not have something to write with or to write on, I want you to put the word in your head. You know which one it is. And when you get back to your dorm tonight, I want you to write it down on a piece of paper in your dorm and put it in your pocket, put it in your wallet, whatever you do that. Okay? Everyone write something down for me. Still stay quiet, please.
Father, when we die, there's no faking anybody. Uh, reality is. Father, I ask you to be with the young people, the adults, that they don't want to live a life of faking people out. One life, last breath, judgment day. It's a day that's unavoidable. It's a day we must get ready for. So, Father, I thank you for all going on and praise for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, now, highs up here, please. Okay, last statement. Uh, Steve's going to come up in just a second. Okay, last statement. Now, if your card says condemned, listen to me. If your card says condemned, do something about it. Okay? Do something about it. If you're ready to make that decision, and do not make this decision lightly. The Bible says count the cost. You count the cost for you ever say yes to Jesus Christ. Will it cost you to follow Jesus Christ? Yes or no? Big time. I've lost jobs because of Jesus Christ. I've lost friends because of Jesus Christ. Charles Barkley told me back in 93, he was Mark Henry, the best friend I have on planet Earth. I seem to hear from anybody who loves Charles Barkley. Charles Barkley's not returned one phone call, one letter in the last four or five years. It wants nothing to do with me. Because I became born again and saved, and I cannot go do all the sins we used to do anymore. Okay, you lose friends over this. This got an email from Egypt. This guy is this close to accepting Jesus Christ. But he knows as soon as he accepts Jesus Christ, he is automatically kicked out of his house. He's gone from his family. And another very strong possibility is that he'll be what? Killed. He's got an email from Kenya. Some people read my books in Kenya. And this guy's uncle's killed. The radical Islamic groups are coming through. They're killing people. And his uncle just got killed. And he's still with I emailed him back. I said, was he born again? It's so all my emails said back. I said, he let me know back. One of his uncle loved the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's tough to lose somebody. But you don't lose somebody if they say yes to Jesus Christ. You don't lose them. I get to see you real soon. We'll catch up down the road a little bit. Okay. You count the cost for you never say yes to Jesus Christ. Okay. I did this at West Point. And a cadet came up to me at West Point and said, Sir, my card says condemned. I said, okay. I said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do something. So we talked for an hour. Finished. I sent him over to the um, head of the OC at the Christian. I said, why don't you talk with this man? That's what he's going to spend time with, not me. Three hours later, they dug through the scriptures. Repentance became born again, serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? If you're, so if you want to do something about that, talk to your home leader, talk to Steve, talk to somebody, make a decision. If your card says forgiven, young people start living like it. Start acting like it. We've got to start sharing with it and boldly reach our campuses for Jesus Christ. Listen to me, we have the only hope for America, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Barack Obama is not our hope, John McCain is not our hope, the Lord Jesus Christ is our hope. It's the only hope for your family, for your school. It's it. It's Jesus Christ. And it's our job to go tell people. Is that right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And that's what we're start talking the next couple of nights. Because once you've got the right answer, we are compelled by the love of God to go tell people. And that's how much fun this is going to be as we step out and start being light. Does Kentucky need light? Yes or no? Yeah. Yes. And when I read my Bible, it's a regular folk. It's fishermen, it's farmers, it's tax collectors, it's middle schools, it's football players, it's cheerleaders, it's high school kids. Who walk light into what? Darkness. Put the darkness. That's our job. And that's what we're talking about. Start doing our job in the days to come. Okay? Thanks for your attention.